Welcome back, everybody, to the final episode of the all-inclusive Mega Man X Retrospective. We have come so far since the X1 review began production in September of 2016, and now it all comes to a head here with Mega Man X8. Oh, why didn't I save Maverick Hunter X for last? <laughs> I'm gonna say this right now. There are plenty of people who love this game to pieces, and that is fine. Opinions are subjective by nature, so if you think this is the best X game there is, or one of them, that is fine. I know opinions tend to fall on deaf ears in the internet, but I'm just saying it now. I didn't care for this game as much as everyone else does. I used to love X8 in my first playthrough since, like I said in my X6 review, I skipped X6 when the bullshit became too much, but after that I fell in love with X8 and declared it one of my favorite X games. The more time rolled by, the more I started hating certain aspects and certain design choices, and that was when I realized that Mega Man X8 was not as good of a package as I once thought it was. In my opinion. I actually really do want to know why everyone loves this game so much. I mean, really, everyone in the comments, I want you to respectfully tell me why you love this game. I'm not trying to be condescending in that regard, I'm just kind of curious since my research has proven lukewarm in finding the true answer. I'm genuinely curious since I'm not in that camp since I don't like... A few things about X8, but I realize I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, like I was saying, this is the 11th and final in my all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective that I've been doing since October of 2016, where I've been searching to find where and why the Mega Man X series went downhill, with Mega Man X8 being the culmination of that. So, for the utmost of context, watch my reviews of X1 to X Command Mission. So instead of wasting time, what do we say we end this retrospective with my review of Mega Man X8 for the PlayStation 2? The story is that humans are sick of Reploids going Maverick all the time and are starting to move to the moon with the Jacob Project, a giant elevator that brings people from the Earth to the moon. There's been a whole new generation of Reploids built with an enhanced version of Axel's copy shot to build it, with the leader of the project being Lumine. However, Vile making his first appearance since Mega Man X3, and no, Extreme 1 does not count since that was a digital recreation of X1 and X2's levels, so he wasn't actually there. Funnily enough, it's been so long since Vile died, the game uses Axel as an excuse to explain who he is. He used to be a Class A hunter, but now he's our sworn enemy. He's a maverick and a wanted criminal. Not complaining, just kind of observing. Now Vile is truly Boba Fett since he has a full-on green color scheme, which is a nice touch since Vile has a different color in all of his major appearances. Since the new generation of Reploids have eight of their best in eight separate locations mining for materials for the orbital elevator, the Maverick Hunters have declared these guys Maverick, and now X, Zero, and Axel have to fight against them with the aid of three navigators that specialize in three areas. Aelia can help you with stage layouts, enemy patterns, and such, and Palak can help you find secret items, and Lair can help you identify boss strategies. Between stages is when our heroes will interact with each other, and I'll get to that. Of course, anyway, Sigma had something to do with it, and now we have to defeat Sigma once all the Mavericks are out of the way. And I must say, I really do love Sigma's design in this game. I mean, it looks awful, but that was done on purpose. Since the subtle detail was that going back to X1, we found out that he has multiple bodies to inherit, and in X3, we defeated the ultimate battle body. Since then, his bodies have been getting worse and worse and worse. Like, look at X5 Sigma. That final form pales in comparison to anything we've seen before that, since it doesn't even move. Or X6, where Sigma was literally a zombie at that point. Here, he literally looks like a few pieces of scrap metal were glued and bolted together, since Sigma is running out of steam at this point. He doesn't even have skin, he's just a skeleton, thus really giving the feeling that this is the final battle since we already know Sigma must be a memory long forgotten by the time X Command Mission happened in 100 years where Sigma doesn't even get mentioned. Another thing worth mentioning about X8's story is that get this, Sigma is there, but he is not the fake out villain, nor is he the main villain at all. Once again, the X series has proven it can subvert your expectations as Lumine reveals that he was the main villain all along and was the one using Sigma and not the other way around. With that said, X and company defeat Lumine, but at a cost, since Axel gets injured and X and Zero have to get him out of there. But the game just sort of ends there, on a cliffhanger. Oh boy, we still don't know what happens from there on out. Does Axel go Maverick? I guess we'll never know. That is the price of poor sales, ladies and gentlemen. Will we ever find out how Mega Man Volnut got off of Elysium? Probably not. Will we ever see what Master Thomas does now that he's turned rogue? Probably not. And will we ever see what happened to Axel? Probably not. I'd love to see a Mega Man X9 answer that question. I would love to see a ZX3 and Legends 3. But the problem is that when game after game sells like trash, that is when we stop getting sequels. I would buy any of those sequels with open arms, but if the only thing that sells are 8-bit throwbacks, then I can see why that stifles creativity for the Mega Man creators. The only X9 that I can ever see people giving a crap about is a 16-bit throwback with gameplay being like X4. And despite loving it, I don't want to see X4 turn 16-bit. 
I want to see what happens next, despite how atrocious the continuity may get at times. I'm kind of rambling, and this is not really a knock against X8, it's just more of me saying that this is a cliffhanger and we'll probably never know what happens after it. I know I spent a much longer time talking about the story in the previous two games, and heck, maybe even X6, but honestly this story doesn't give me much material, since beyond the fact that thankfully Sigma's not the main villain, and how I really like Sigma's design, eh, this story does the same old, same old for all the characters. I don't really have much to say on that regard. I think it's pretty alright, pretty entertaining. I didn't have anything terrible to say about it like X7, and even the continuity I have nothing to say about in this game since at this point the damage has been done. It would be a huge overstatement to say X8 seals the deal since X6 started that train, X7 ran it off the tracks, and X Command Mission sent it flying down to the abyss. Kind of like what X6 as a game did to the series in one fell swoop. But in all seriousness, X8 just kind of exists at the bottom of the abyss, leaving me with pretty much nothing more to add. However, for the first time, I actually do have something positive to say about the continuity. I was talking to my friend Nick and Agua Magna about the canon of the later X games and how that ties into the Zero games. To paraphrase, what we were talking about allowed me to see the good things in the Mega Man X canon. One of those good things being how in X1 to X3, the visual design of the world doesn't look too terribly different from the classic series. However, when we get to X4, the design does seem to be much different with new tech like flying cities and space stations. Since these games all take place in 21XX, the X is being the same thing as X himself, meaning it could be any year from 2100 to 2199. So X4 maybe takes place a long time after X3, given how the characters like Dr. Kane don't make an appearance in that game. And they didn't forget about him since they mentioned him in a flashback before X1 that is in X4. With the colony crashing in X5 leading to the rebuilding of the world in X6 and X7, and so X8 might be several years after that since the world looks much different from the way it did in X7. With Command Mission being 100 years later making sense as to why it doesn't really look like the other games. I do think it's a major problem in the storytelling for us the players to have to figure out whether or not X7 onward are canon, and make our own personal headcanon to fill in the blanks as to how it all works, but still, when there is something good, I'm gonna discuss it. Like I said in my X6 review, I said positives of that game, but I guess it fell on deaf ears. Whenever I get to games like Mega Man Zero and ZX and Legends, I'll be talking about another one of the subtle details of the Mega Man timeline, but we'll get to that when we get to that. With that said, the voice acting is again the Command Mission voice cast, and like I said in that video, I really like these guys. Definitely the best voices for all these characters, however the dialogue itself... Darn! X? What's the matter? The mission's only just begun. That's right. It's begun again. How long must this war go on? Yeah, they had to get that line in for the 10th time, right? Also, since this game has the logic that certain elements from X5's good and bad ending happened, is Zero mad at Sigma for wanting to bring his inner Maverick out, or actually doing it? Or just crashing the colony? I really don't know the answer to that. Also, Axel's line here makes no sense given the conversation. How long must this war go on? Just the thought of wiping the floor with those Mavericks makes my trigger finger itch. Other than that, x 8 story is pretty much in one ear and out the other. Something about Axel being a new generation prototype, blah 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 blah. In addition to all that philosophical crap that they try to do... You mean to tell me you've never thought such things yourself, Zero? That the world wishes for destruction and nothing more? That's why space rockets were invented, to escape this destructive world. Give me a break. How are the graphics? My god, they look horrible. The game decides to abandon the cel shaded art style of X7 and X Command Mission in favor of a more... whatever you call this. I mean, realistic? I'm not sure what they were going for here, but I just don't think it looks really that good. Like, look at Zero's Z-Saber. Or the way the faces look. In general, I just think the 3D avatars are just god-awful, like most of the Mavericks. The environments also look so bleak and uninteresting. It's most commonly different shades of gray, brown, and black. While there are some exceptions to this, X8 is just an ugly-ass game through and through. Not helping would be the fact that the game runs at a 480i resolution, which, yes, may have been standard practice for the PS2. I just hate that so much, because the back of the box is progressive scan listed, so why is it not in the game? Even then, 480p is not going to save a game with poor textures, but you get my point. 480i is certainly not helping in this regard. The soundtrack is also one of my lesser favorites in the X series. I have literally played and beaten all of them at this point, and while the composition of some of them is fine, the instrumentation lacks any variety, making the whole soundtrack just kind of sound boring and repetitive.
more of this. Not this. This soundtrack is just so painfully forgettable. I just find that to be disappointing since X1 to X7 are some of my favorite game soundtracks with catchy and unforgettable themes all throughout. Saying it all bores me as selling it a bit short though. Mega Man X8 does have some incredible tracks that are some of my favorites in the series like the Jacob Elevator. or some of the others. So take my opinion with a grain of salt, I just didn't care for the soundtrack as much. However, I think that's enough rambling on that front. The intro stage of Mega Man X8 is an effective tutorial for all the basic ideas in the game like the team feature and the rescue mechanic, allowing a partner character to jump in and save the player character from being grabbed by an enemy. This part also gets you fairly acclimated with all three characters since there are parts where you have to play as all three by themselves so that you know how to use Axel's glide, which thankfully has been made to work consistently now with tapping the X button twice. We also learn how to do the combo finisher, which is usable when having the energy meter filled. When pressing the button at the right time, the two characters release a barrage of saber swings and bullets all over the screen, annihilating the enemies. I personally only use it on the bosses, but that's just me. We also get another tutorial on how shields work since pretty much every enemy is rocking one, and by slashing them with a Z-Saber combo, that causes them to break, or a charge shot from X. With that said though, that brings us to the main game. Mega Man X8 brings the series back to its 2D roots, and I'll say these are probably the smoothest controls the X series has ever seen. While X7 was really good in that regard too, the slow pace of the game kind of killed it for me. Here, the characters just feel weightless, which sounds like a criticism, but it's actually a compliment since it enhances the fast paced gameplay more than it hinders. In regards to the characters specifically, X is the same as he always has been since the dawn of the franchise, so I really don't have too much to say about him. Zero is now back to his PS1 self after X7, and he's really fun to use in this game with the same double jumping and saber spinning we all love. Although a weird thing is that Zero's dash is the shortest lasting dash in the game. Don't know why, but whatever. Axel, however, has received a huge overhaul, since like I said in X7, he was just a way worse X. Here he kind of plays like base in Mega Man 10. I would say Mega Man in base, but Axel can't double jump. So anyway, Axel can shoot in any direction which allows him to hit targets at an angle with ease without the fucking stupid lock-on mechanic. His copy shot is also much more powerful than it was in X7, so that's another plus, but I still don't find myself using it all that much. Also, he's the fastest of the group, which also is nice for chase levels like Earth Rock Trilobite. Wait, what did I just say? Uh, whatever, I'll get back to that. The button layout has also been simplified, which is also really good since now I can play with my preferred configuration on like X7. The team feature has been brought back again like I said, and despite them not adding in any team specific abilities, they did make an attempt with the combo finishers. Also another huge improvement is that when getting killed by an enemy, you swap places with the other character which is another great improvement. I wish it worked that way on spikes but it would be too good to be true. Accompanying our heroes are three navigators. In the story bit I talked about who they are and what they do, I do appreciate the added variety being put in the navigator system since you're hunting for power ups then bring pallet along. If you're having trouble with a boss, bring lair. 
don't know where to go, bring Alia. But if you don't like this idea to begin with, then X8 allows you to also not bring any of them to stages with you, which gives the player the agency to decide how their experience will be. Thank God. So you see, up to this point we've established that X8 has all the elements of a great game with the things I've already discussed. But how does it handle the most important thing to the X series? Level design and items. The answer is meh. Thus bringing the whole game experience down alongside it, in my opinion. So let us dive in. I'm not kidding you when I say that this game has a few flaws that ultimately make me not enjoy it as a package, the level design being one of them. Starting with the fact that in my opinion there are so many gimmicks in this game, including not one, but two ride chaser stages, both of which are embarrassing since Gigabolt Man of War can be beaten in under one minute if you know what you're doing, since all you have to do is shoot him and if you don't catch up to him in the first three seconds then the whole time will just be you chasing his ass down and then out of nowhere the invisible time limit runs out and you are fucked and have to do it again. The other ride chaser is an avalanche yeti stage and it's got to be the worst one in the entire series since you get killed in next to no time as you have to shoot down enemies in addition to falling through floors if you jump at the wrong angle. Trust me, it happens. In fact, there's another problem I have with this entire game. There are so many moments in stages where you get locked in between two doors and have to kill enemies. Why? What is this, Sonic 06? I mean seriously, I do not see the fun factor in this. It never lasts too long, but why is it in the game at all? As I stand in the corner as Axel not even moving an inch, raking in hit combos? Like is this a fucking Arkham game or something? As much as I love the Arkham series, I certainly don't remember buying an Arkham game when I picked up Mega Man X8. Trilobite stage is just you getting chased by and then chasing down a giant mechanoloid, which at the very least uses the core mechanics, but still, can I just get a level where I platform? In Burn Rooster stage, the camera pans upward as platforms rise from the bottom of the screen, which is so much fun, right guys? And especially when I die only to see a platform appear where I died. Following that, the level just becomes nothing but cramped spaces and spikes all over the place. Hell, after the boss is over, we have to repeat the intro only in reverse. Bamboo Pandemonium is the only real level in the game since we're just left to platform through, which is great! I also love how many multiple pathways there are on this stage that take full advantage of the great controls. I don't like how long the level is, but I'll take it to get more of this. Optic Sunflower stage is going for the same angle as Cyber Peacock in Mega Man X4, but where do you get warped here? Rooms to fight enemies. Ugh, fuck this shit. Gravity Antonian makes you press buttons to flip the rooms to move blocks. Over, and over, and over and over again, with some truly awful camera angles. And also this spike section can go to hell. Apparently though, if you want to get past this easily, you can come to this stage third, which triggers a vile fight instead of this spike section, so that's neat. Last but not least being fucking Dark Mantis's stage. My god, I hate this stage. Remember when I complained about the nightmare effects in Rainy Turtloid's stage? Well, multiply that by 10,000 you have this stage. Here I literally can't see anything other than the health bar. How am I supposed to see? By following this slow as shit light bulb? That thing can be killed by the way, and he looks like an enemy. How was I supposed to know he was supposed to help me? Doesn't help that this section has spikes in it to piss you off. Can't forget about those amazing stealth sections where getting caught means fighting enemies, and how not getting caught rewards you with fighting enemies. Like holy shit, most of these levels are really bad. The old games had gimmicky stages every now and again, but not a 7 to 8 ratio. Yes, I consider turning the lights off, switching blocks, and being chased by a giant mechanoloid gimmicky. So does that mean that something like Matt Rex's stage is gimmicky since you get chased there? No, since that didn't last the whole level, that was a set piece. Also, what is up with the weird ass intermission stage, where you kill enemies? I guess to grind for medals, but there are so many better ways to do that. I wouldn't mind many of the things I've already said here if it wasn't for my biggest issue with X8, but I'll get to the other usual stuff out of the way first. X again has two new armors, and they finally come up with a way to optimize the armor system. By getting your first light capsule, you get the neutral armor, which has the skeleton of both the armors, those being the Hermes armor and the Icarus armor. From there, the part you found is equipped to the neutral armor for the remainder of the stage, and in the stage select, you can choose which parts you want in the stage. See, this is a fantastic idea. The parts themselves are also really good. In general, I'll give you a tip though. I think the Hermes armor is the better of the two, with increased dashing speed, lessened damage, and increased charging speed. Although I love the Icarus' armor's arm part since it makes the regular buster do way more damage with a laser for a charge shot. It also has other benefits like less damage with lessened recoil from damage. If you play X8, I recommend that you experiment with these armors to decide your preferred combination since it's probably one of my favorite things in this game. The bosses are also alright. I mean, they do their patterns and they get their asses kicked by the weaknesses as you jump around the room trying to get hits in. I also think that these are by far the stupidest Maverick names in the whole series. 
Like they aren't even scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point. This is the bottom of the barrel. Earthrock, Trilobite, Gigabolt, Mana War, Bamboo, Pandemonium, an Optic, Sunflower. Literally, that sounds like a joke. I think overall X7 and the weaker roster of Mavericks since those guys were really stupid. And that, they didn't even look good. X8 at the very least simplified the Maverick designs quite a bit. Again, Nick and Agua Magno was the one who let me in on this detail, so I'll do my best to explain it. With X7, the designs of the Mavericks started getting ridiculous. Take Snipe Anidor, for example. He was a hot mess, with stripes, claws, and cannons put all over him with a tail to boot. Not a good design. Same process extends to many of X7's Mavericks, with the exception of Wind Crow Rang. The ones that didn't even have that problem were the extremely stupid, like Tornado Tanyan. Here in X8, they've been simplified, like I said, but not just in terms of how all over the place they are. Many of them resemble humanoids with animal-like traits, which was what X1 to X6 were going for, if I'm not mistaken. Each Maverick in X8 is one part of their body that is emphasized, like Bamboo's giant claws or Rooster's giant feet. This makes for a much more well-designed group of Mavericks in X7. Still, I the names at the bottom of the barrel of the series, but just the designs I think are quite well done. I would take something like this over Ground Scaravich or Commander Your Mark any day. When you beat them, you get a new weapon, and by the way, these are also pretty good for Zero, with much simpler button combos, making performing his moves much more satisfying than the bullshit of X6 and the OP crap of X7. For X, these are some of my least favorites in this series. Not as bad as X7, but still. Again, none of these like the Thunder Dancer or the Drift Diamond really help me in comparison to the Buster. Like, how am I supposed to use Optic Sunflower's weapon on Sigma, which is supposedly his weakness, but it feels almost impossible to hit him with it? That would be like if the top spin was the weakness of the final boss in Mega Man 3! At the very least, at the very least, Axel's weapons are different from X, but that's not too terrible much of a compliment since X7 shouldn't have done that bullshit to begin with. Although that's not giving the game enough credit since Axel's weapons are actually fun to use if you ask me, so that's what's most important. Repeat the process eight more times and you're in the castle stages, one of which being a level where you ride an elevator and kill enemies. Ending with a boss fight against Vile, which are always enjoyable in this game since it's satisfying to use his weakness on him since it does a lot of damage. The next one being a boss rush stage, it pretty much adds nothing else to comment on other than the fact that they actually explain why there is a boss rush. The reason being that these are the new generation Reploids with Axel's enhanced copy shot. Same for the fake Sigma you fight after it. Which leads us to the moon, which is Sigma's base. I'm genuinely curious, do there exist Mega Man X levels with more spikes than this? Like seriously, what the hell? They're everywhere, and let's just say I don't care for it much. And no, it's not because I'm just not good or whatever crap people come up with in my X6 comments. The castle levels of Mega Man X2 are challenging since you have all the information you need to succeed, but the challenge comes from good design. Gate 2 is not challenging, it's just tedious. There's a huge difference. Although mainly, I really don't care for this level for one big reason coming up. With the Sigma fight being... a boss. I mean, he kicked my ass, but at the very least he wasn't poorly designed like X3 or X7. Following that is the boss of Lumine, which is pretty cool since he reuses the previous boss's attacks, making the boss fight feel really climactic. But let's just answer the question, why do I not enjoy X8 as much as everyone else does? All the good ideas, all the great mechanics I mentioned, and balanced out with all the gimmicks with playable stages, what is the straw that broke this camel's back? That was it right there. Retried ships. What? were they thinking? So in the levels we collect metals and use it on this shop to get more health and get sub tanks and weapon energy tanks. In addition to extra saber swings and all that other stuff. Fine in concept since I like the idea of buying things like extra saber swings or reducing wall scaling speed, however why do they make heart tanks and sub tanks things you buy? Aren't I supposed to find these things? I mean it doesn't ruin the game since there's still some exploration like the light capsules or the new rare metals which put sub tanks up for sale in the first place. But lives? We can't find those anymore? As opposed to letting us get 10 lives, we're now limited to 5. Remember in Mega Man Zero 01 how they tried retried chips and it sucked ass? And Zero 02 fixed that and brought us back to the standard live system of every Mega Man game before Zero 01? Well, X8 decided to bring them back. And while they're better than they were in Zero 01, it's still such a stupid idea. Remember back in X5 and X6 and X7 where lives meant nothing? Well, that's good, since there are ways to make games challenging without lives. X5 through X7 didn't really do that, but they tried. And here we're back to X1 to X3 logic, where game overs means doing the whole level again. But these levels are long. Run out of retry chips and you're going back to the shop, buying more, and getting your ass back in there. Seriously, if X6 did this, the game would be borderline unplayable. So say you're in Burn Rooster stage, you beat the boss, and die for the fifth time in the following climb section since you lost all your four other lives in the spike section, well, you have to do the whole level over again. I seriously hate this. I hate it so much. 
The process extends over the entire game, and when you combine the poor camera angles and do or die moments with the retry chip system, then you have one deadly concoction in your hands. Since the levels are now made more cheap thanks to previously discussed issues paired with starting the level over again once you die five times. Easy mode grants you infinite retry chips, and for that reason alone, I must say, play the game on easy. Sure, it sounds like it would be mocking your skills, but X5 through X7 had infinite lives, and I don't remember anyone complaining there. However, on easy mode, you cannot fight the final boss with Lumine. The game just cuts to black after Sigma and tells you to piss off and play on normal mode, with no warning beforehand. Although, if you don't care about that, then like I said, I wholeheartedly recommend easy mode, since I can sit back and enjoy the levels for what they are as opposed to having this retry chip system block my enjoyment of the game. A part of me feels like I'm not being fair to X8, since I think so many of the new ideas in Mega Man X8 are fantastic. But the two most important elements, that being level design and the way items work, just piss me off. So what am I supposed to take away from a game that makes me mad while playing it? I mean, what do you guys think? As a package, Mega Man X8, like I've repeated again and again, the new armor system, the improved partner system, and making Axel a unique character, and the great controls are things I love about X8. But the flaws I do have tend to lessen the enjoyment I have while playing it. On easy mode, I can enjoy it as a pick up and play like the new game plus in X7. People are going to tell me I hate challenge, but I really don't. In X8, I still die many times in easy mode, but the lack of retry chips makes all the difference. Like I said in the intro, if you like this game and don't have any issue with retry chips and what I consider gimmicky levels, then tell me why. You don't have to attack me personally to let you know that you disagree. I want to hear your opinion on X8. I've said it a billion times, but I want to know why this is the beloved entry of the X series. I see many of the gameplay elements, but I can't get past level design and retried chips. However, I'm done with the negativity. I really don't want it to seem like I hate Mega Man X, but that's just my honest opinion on a lot of these later games. And that covers Mega Man X8, and with that said, we've reached the end of the all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective. Why did I do this retrospective the way I did? Why bother covering all 12 games in these videos? Well, I'll tell you guys a bit of a story. On August 3rd, 2016, I released my review of Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. And wait! Before you click off the video, because there he goes again talking about that video, but it is so important, so give me a second. That video was something I'd wanted to do for ages. I had first gotten the ambition to do what I'm doing right now back in 2011 after Sly 4 got announced, and so I wanted to share my thoughts on my favorite and least favorite games. And when Sly 4 came out in 2013, I had the Phantom Menace effect fall upon me, and I wanted to make a channel even more so, just so I could review this game and tell you why I did not like it, and say the things that not many people went in depth talking about. So starting the channel at the end of 2015, my goal was to do that review, and when I did, it was a huge video for me. In terms of gaming, five whole years of my life had finally been resolved. I did the video, and I loved it. You all loved it. It was most certainly way better than anything I had done before. After the Metal Gear review at the end of the month, though, my channel kind of died. Not officially, but as my friend TGX described, it was like being lost in the woods. I had a real feeling of, where do I go from here? I didn't know the answer to that at the time. Hence why September of 2016 was probably one of the most barren months in my channel's history with only a Jay's Reviews light to show for itself. Jay's Let's Plays had made a comeback at the time and I was doing the Super Nintendo XLPs, which has been incredibly high on my YouTube bucket list alongside Sly 4. Honestly, I was ready to just be done with Jay's Reviews, which is ironic given the closing line of the Sly 4 review. But what is not ending is this channel. This video is the reason I made this channel. I don't think I'm stopping anytime soon, since I think the channel has a lot of potential and has grown quite a bit since the beginning. I honestly felt like surpassing the Sly 4 review was genuinely impossible. I didn't think I could ever muster up a video that analytical or well made ever again. So anyway, at the end of September I had gotten this sudden passion to talk about Mega Man X, since besides Sly Cooper, this is easily one of my favorite game franchises of all time. More on that later though. There were growing pains involved through my X1 and X2 reviews, but in my opinion, not only have I met up with Sly 4 in quality, but I full on surpassed Sly 4 in quality, and now with the last few X reviews and MGS 1 and 2 and Sly 1 and 2, I have super annuated it. Sly 4 is not in my top 5 videos anymore. Not even close. Most importantly, ever since this retrospective came out, this channel grew exponentially. It was a slow start, but here we are with over 1,000 subscribers in a matter of a few months. This is why I do the evolution videos, because keeping track of and honoring your history is so unbelievably important. I spent every day 
from November 9th, 2015 to all the way when Sly 4 came out in early August to get to 100 subscribers. And even then, it took me until Christmas to get to 200, but we reached 300 by February. By February! From there, it was all uphill, with me going from 300 to 1,000 in two months. And I owe it all to you guys when watching and enjoying, or not enjoying, the extra retrospective from start to finish. The possibilities are endless from here on out, although we still do have some unfinished business to take care of with Sly Cooper, but that's for another day. So to tie this back into Mega Man X itself, where does the series go from here? Given how the Mega Man franchise has been quiet for so long, and given the low quality standard the X series went out on, things are looking grim. Mega Man X has not had a game for 11 years, and I think a comeback is upon us. With Capcom asking fans which Mega Man collection they want to see after the classic series, and now X being confirmed for the new Marvel vs. Capcom game, I really do believe Mega Man X has not breathed its last breath yet. If not on the official side of things, then the fans will most certainly be providing, with the most obvious example being Mega Man X Corrupted, which is looking to be a damn good game in its own right, with so many new ideas under its belt. Can't forget about Mega Man X Maverick's Fury, which while in my opinion not looking quite as grand as Corrupted, still looks to be a fun time, especially since recently the game has had new additions made to the controller settings and graphics settings contributed by none other than Dr. M64 of AM2R fame. There have been and are so many Mega Man X fan games in development right now that I can't even keep track of them all. Also, gotta love the Steam game, 20XX, which is basically a Mega Man X game in everything but name, since you play as a blue character with an arm cannon and a red guy with a 3 slash saber combo, and both characters can dash and wall jump. The concept of the game is a bit different though, with you having to see how far you can get in one life. But be sure to check that game out if you want to see some more X action. It'll surely fill your X cravings, regardless of the different focus. And we also can't forget about the amazing works of ROM hackers like xjustin 3009 x who developed and is still tweaking Mega Man X3 The Zero Project and is working on giving X2 the same treatment. And when any of these fan projects come out, you can bet I'll be giving it a review for all you folks at home. In the meantime, you can check out all these people via the links in the description. These videos have gotten heavy on the rage after Extreme 1, and that is honestly because I care about the quality of the Mega Man X series. I love it to death since it's so endearing, since this series, while being home to some of the worst stories and games in the Mega Man franchise, is also home to some of the best. This is a series with memorable characters, a great feeling of progression and triumph, in addition to great exploration, epic boss battles, unforgettable music, really colorful visuals, great weapons, and the list goes on and on. There are so many things that they could do with this series going forward. So for that reason, I'm looking forward to the future of the X series, and I think you should be too. So here's to you, X and Zero. May you live on to fight more Mavericks at least passing console generation. As for myself, this has been quite the exhausting, albeit satisfying marathon. Needless to say, the next era of Mega Man reviews on the channel will not be coming for a while, guys. In the meantime, I have done and will be doing some guest appearances with Mega Man X related content, since on Innocent Kristoff Gavin's channel, I was in his top 15 Mega Man X Mavericks list that you should all be checking out, link in the description. And in regards to any other guest appearances, I'll keep you guys posted, so stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed the retrospective as much as I enjoyed making it, and in the comments, I really want you guys to tell me. What did you think of the all-inclusive Mega Man X retrospective? I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether it be good or bad. So with that said, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.